Welcome to another inspiring message from Victory Church. We believe that God is at work right now to bring victory to your life. For more information about Victory Church, find us online at www.victorychurchnwa.com. Hallelujah! 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just be seated for a second if you'd like. Uh, I don't know exactly where I'm going right now, okay? I'm just going to obey God. Let me say this to every person in this room. I said it a few weeks ago, if I remember correctly. I think it was here. I don't think it was in North Carolina. Might have been there. But this is what I said. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what happens is you put a target on your chest that the devil is after. You say, well, Pastor, I thought everything was going to be cool and great and not have no more problems when I got saved. No, I can't assure you of that. I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the case. But what I do know is this, the devil never likes you. If you're a threat to his kingdom, he doesn't like you. He doesn't care for you and he doesn't care for your life. It has been soon for Pastor Jeannie and I this will be 34 years that we have been in Northwest Arkansas. And during this 34 years that we've been here, and uh, I think uh, Pat and Jim can, can uh, verify the other two years prior to us coming, that the devil has tried his best to squash, put out the flame, stop uh, this church from being. And what I have watched God do over the years that I've been here, I've watched God just miraculously time and time and time again bring in the resources, do the kind of things that were necessary for victory to still be here. Now, he doesn't just want us here as a, uh, a body taking up space. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something right now that's going to sound critical when I say it. And I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just looking at the economics of what goes on in the kingdom of God. There are lots of times that there are churches that are doing nothing but occupying space. And what they're doing is they are stealing the funds that it takes to help mobilize the body of Christ, they're taking those funds just to occupy space. And I'm going to tell you the truth. We don't need a church on every corner if that church is not on fire for God. Are you with me? Am I wrong when I say that? You know, I just see some things going on out of the ego of man. And frankly, I don't have any ego anymore. I'm past ego. If you want to want to go to a church where the pastor gets up and he's got an ego, uh, the, I'm sure there's one here in town somewhere or in the area that you could go to. I don't have an ego, and you don't have to, to stroke me to make me happy anymore because frankly, at my age, you know, you can tell me I'm handsome and you're only trying to stroke my ego because I know I'm getting old and I'm not handsome. You know, I've had all kinds of things said one direction or another. And, and, and ego is not what's going on with me anymore. My biggest concern, my greatest concern is you and your children and your families. I want to be here for them. 
You know, I look in this room today. I can go, I can span across the crowd of people who are here, and I see people who have for at least 28, 29 years uh, of our being here, probably longer than that, maybe 32 or 33, maybe the 34 years of our being here. We've had people that because of one thing or another, maybe they felt called to go and help another church or what have you, and they have, they have left and went other places. I've had some that the devil has squashed them, squeezed them, knocked them down, and, and lied to them and make them think that they didn't need church and they didn't need people. And I've watched God bring people back to the church time and time again. And we have a saying that we started a year ago here at the church that says this, we are here. And maybe you don't understand why we, we said we are here. Because what happens is there are places that are founded on ego. And when they don't get enough strokes on their ego, they quit. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? There's no ego in this place. We are here for you. We are here for your kids. We're here for those who have walked away from the house of God. That they know that there is going to be a place they can come back to. That when the word talks about the prodigal son leaving the father's house and going away and doing all the things that he did, when he finally came to himself, the scripture says, he said, I will return to the Father's house. And the thing that he knew is the Father had moved. The Father was still there. You say, well, that's talking about the kingdom. I understand, but can I tell you that, the, that people have to have a place of contact. You understand what I'm saying? When it comes to the Father's house, this becomes the Father's house. That when they come here, they know they can meet up with God. Now, with that said, maybe I'll say a little bit of my message this morning. I don't know that I'm going to go into it in big detail. I don't have plans to now. Uh, you can go through some of the notes that I have there and you can get the gist of what's there uh, from the notes, but let me say this. Victory is not about one generation. It's not about one generation. If that's what you're looking for is a church that's only going to satisfy your own petty wants and needs. Now that sounds bad, doesn't it, when I say it that way, but can I, I'm going to I'm going to preface what I say because I see people that are in and out of church just simply because they don't like it because the church stands too much. They don't like it because it's too loud. They don't like the kind of music that they play. And can I, can I say something? The Bible says that you are like trees planted. Now, I just returned from North Carolina where there was a lot of moisture and a lot of rain, tons of rain. Everything over there was lush and beautiful. And I returned to Northwest Arkansas and it is dry as a bone here, dry everywhere. But you know what? I don't see trees going through the air saying, I'm going to, Calif uh, to North Carolina. <laughs> to get, I just think it's going to be better there because it's wetter. <laughs> you say, Pastor, that's stupid. No more stupid than you being a tree, and all of a sudden you uh, want to uproot yourself and move over to another place. I... Uh, uh,
No tomatoes? Somebody caught them at the door? You know, what I see here at Victory is we got people who are planted. They're planted. They don't, you know, there's always a temptation that comes to take you out of your planting and move you to another place uh, because maybe the water seems to be cooler and nicer and greater at that particular place at the moment. But can I tell you that every place has its storms, every place has its droughts, every place has its problems. If you look for a church that is perfect, uh, go there, and then it won't be perfect anymore because you are there. That is, that's, I'm not trying to be critical today, am I? No. I'm just, I know. You say, Pastor, you, when you come home, you're full of it. That's right. I am. I hope it's full of God. Now, here's what I see. When you leave here today, whether you like it or not, you're going into a battlefield. You're going into a battlefield. I don't like our battlefield today. I don't like our battlefield because, frankly, if I say anything when I leave this building to a lot of people, they think I'm political if I say it. Or they think that I'm just a crazy preacher who only wants to read the Bible from a perspective that seems to be very legalistic. And I don't think I'm legalistic by any means at all. But they think I am. I go into a world where our children are taught compromise. Are you with me? I go into a world where our kids are taught compromise. Where they no longer can deal with gender without it becoming a legal issue? You know, I remember when babies were born that they looked to see what they were. And they would come out and say, Dad, we inspected, and you got a boy, or you got a girl. They didn't say, if you don't like what you got, we'll correct it. I'm about to cry. It makes me emotional. I get angry and mad at the very thought that people have come to the place that they want to play God. And you are far from it. But yet we have a world out there that if I call boys boys anymore or girls girls anymore, I can get in trouble in some states. How ridiculous. Are you with me? You say, what's going on? We are in warfare. You say, oh, is it natural warfare? No, no, no. This didn't start as a natural thing. This started as a spiritual thing. And, and let, me, let me say this to you now. Every battle is first won or, or lost in the spiritual. Before any battle can be won in the natural, it will be won or lost in the spiritual. Now, what do you mean by that? There is a war that's going on before you ever experience some particular things in your life. And it's a war between light and darkness. Uh, 
I, I gave you scriptures today that says uh, things like this, that we have an adversary, the devil, that's going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I gave you scriptures like this today that says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, I, I gave you uh, scriptures today that says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And uh, then the very first scripture I gave you was from the book of Revelations where it talks about Michael fighting against Satan, that old dragon Satan, and there was war in the heavens to the point that Satan was cast out into the earth. And it says about him that he's going about violently in the earth because he knows his time is short. Short. He's doing everything that he possibly can in a short length of time to destroy everything. Now, with all of that said, this is where we must come to. I, I gave you a little historical thing about the United States. I happened to be born right after the end of this in 1949. I was one of those kids that was called the baby boomer. Uh, it was a part of what the was developed, the generation that was developed after World War II. And you see, World War II started in Europe with us, and we were fighting there for a long period of time, and we came home uh, just as we were getting ready to come home as winners. Then Japan decides to jump into the picture in uh, uh, 1941, uh, you can find the exact date there. Some of you know it better than me and can probably find the date quicker than me, but it's in your notes. But on that particular day, they bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And when they bombed Pearl Harbor, our nation that was already wore out with war, we had faced tons and tons of years of our boys being sent overseas and, uh, and uh, them going into foxholes in Europe. I know uh, one particular man that, that I met as a young boy that had to wear steel plates in his shoes. He wore Converse tennis shoes back in the day when Converse was just a tennis shoe, but he had a steel plate because that steel plate gave him mobility because all of his toes had frozen off by riding as a soldier in a cattle car on a freight rail in Europe. And our men came home abused, messed up, wore out from the, the time in Europe, and guess what happens? Japan decides to attack us because they find us at our weakest moment. And when they decide to attack us, you know what we did? We did something that has never been before for us or since for us. We mobilized the whole nation. Detroit, where all of our vehicles were being built at that time, they took all the molds for vehicles and they set them to the side. And what they did is they started building tanks, jeeps, big military trucks, and aircraft. Thousands of aircraft were built because this next war that we're going to be fighting is going to mean that we have to use planes to get there, and it's going to take more than we've ever had before. So what they did... You don't find any cars being built because, and you don't find cars from that era because they weren't being built because it stopped. Now, in the middle of all of that, everything became rationed. 
people today, when we, the only rationing we have when it comes to gasoline at this time is the rationing of the price. The rationing is on your pocketbook. But at that particular time, you only got so many gallons of gasoline per week. You couldn't buy new tires for your vehicle. So what they had to do is they did every kind of thing under the sun to try and keep tires together on cars going down the streets in America. It, the reason for it was everything was focused. They were mobilized on the war. They knew that America would somehow make it. There would be enough farmers and people to provide enough food that people could survive here in the United States without having to have all the processed goods and the other things that they had been doing before. They knew that what they had to do is they had to focus on the effort in Japan to win. Now... We did it, and we won. But here's the big thing that happened out of it. It affected every generation at that time. Grandmas and grandpas, great-grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads, kids, older kids, younger kids, they were all affected by the war. Everybody was touched by it. Now, let me say this to you now about our war. Every generation is touched by our war. The war between light and darkness is not a, a one-generation war. It's a, it's a war that every generation faces. Now, I'm going to say this to you, how he attacks me and how he attacks my grandson Christian is two different ways. Because if he attacked me like he, uh, with things that he attacks Christian with, I would laugh at him. I'd say, no, that ain't going to bother me. Every generation has their own particular way that the devil comes to attack them because he's out to destroy you. John 10, 10, the thief comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. You say, oh, pastor, get off of that. No, get on it. Understand it, that he's out to kill, steal, and destroy every generation that he can. He wants to destroy grandmas and grandpas, great-grandmas and great-grandpas. He wants to destroy moms and dads. He wants to destroy families. He wants to touch our children. He wants to destroy our kids. So what does he do? He puts every kind of stupid thing out there he can to try and grab hold of our kids' lives and destroy them. You know, I, when I was growing up, when you talked about drugs, drug was something that happened in New York City and other places in the country. You know, when you talked about weed, it was what we tried to kill out in the field. We didn't have, well, I didn't know anything about weed. You know, and, and, and what we've done is uh, as time has went along, now what was weird for me in my day is now become common for our kids. You know, do you think I would ever think about doing some of the drug things that our kids do today? And you say, are you making light of it? No, I'm not. It's exactly the opposite. Because what I see today the devil doing is the devil's trying everything he possibly can to destroy our kids. And he's making it so common and easy for it to happen that our kids' lives are being destroyed so easily now. And a part of it is this. 
We must do this. One generation must mobilize, help to mobilize the next generation down and the next generation down. Now, here's what the devil does. Are you ready for this? You're probably not. But he gets you so introverted, stuck on yourself, stuck on your personal need, stuck on your personal wants and desires, that you don't even think about anything but you. We become so selfish. When God is not about selfish, he is about selfless. So if we don't watch ourselves, we get so caught up in our own junk because that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants your attention off of the purpose that's there. I, I have a message that I preached for several years. I would go from church to church, and it seemed like God just let this message become my big message at that particular time. And it was called Satanic Diversions. Because, you see, God has a plan for your life and a plan for you to be involved in, but the devil puts diversions in your path to keep you from doing what God calls you to do. And, and a part of those things is he messes with your finances and gets you so caught up in your finances that you don't even think about the will of God or the purpose of God in your life. You know, I, I think about people in our church and the things that, that victory has been involved in in our years past. And, uh, you know, I, I have this brag deal that I do, and I do it, and I love doing it. You know, we, I will get to talking to people, and they'll get to talking about how they, the things that they're involved in and how that they've helped in disaster relief. And I just turn around to, uh, and, and I point toward Jeannie, and I said, this lady and people in our church were responsible for over 360,000 documented hot meals during Katrina and Rita alone. Now, you know how she did that? Let me tell you how she did that. Mark Wiggins left his job, wasn't making a thin dime from anything. He left his job and went and did, at times, what seemed to be thankless acts, sacrificing for the vision that victory had, and worked at her side, and when a generator went down, he made sure it was back up and running. When she needed lights, he got her lights. When she needed water, she, he got her water. He did whatever he had to do to make sure it happened. And he did it not thinking of his own personal self at that time. And you know what he still does? The same stinking thing. Out of all, after all these years, he's still doing it. And what he said to me, Pastor, I'm here. I'm going to do it. And, I pl and he said to me yesterday, he said, I have people saying to me, when are you going to retire? And he said, retire? Why would I retire? He said, I am retired. I'm doing what I love to do. And you know what he loves to do is the will of God. That is Incredible, but I know people that make themselves so busy with junk away from the kingdom of God and they use it as their excuse for not mobilizing. Are you with me? And you say, well, Pastor, you know, people have to work and they have to make money and they have to get by. I know that. I know that. I understand what you're saying that way. 
But let me tell you, I think a lot of us fabricate things to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Now, okay. Can I get real for a minute? Bring it down to where you are today? You see, what we try to do is we try to get everybody to come into this room, to church, to meet with God. But can I express something to you? You're not going to get some people here until you reach them out there. You touch them out there. I know people that wouldn't dare have a home group in their home because they're scared that kids would mess up their pretty house. But how are we going to mobilize to get the work of the kingdom of God done if we don't use our cars, our homes, if you please, your time and your finances to help get it done. Now, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to just say this. I can't tell you to do it if I would. And I don't think anybody in this room today would argue with the fact that Jeannie and I are not willing to give our all for the kingdom of God. Because I am. I'm willing to do it for Cole. Christian. Helena. Cesar and Diane's kids. I'm willing to do it. Every child in this room or in this building today. I was, we was talking on the way to church this morning. This kind of talk that goes on in a pastor's car as he's coming to church on Sunday morning. You know. We got Pastor Lance and Jeannie and I in the car, and we're going down the road, and we're talking about our clothes for a second, you know. And, uh, and Jeannie always has to do one particular thing for me on Sunday when I come to church, because frankly, can't afford every week to take my dress slacks to the cleaners and have them cleaned again, so I wear them over and over and over again. And, uh, and usually, Every week before I leave the house or after I'm in the car and it's bright enough so that my old eyes can see it, there's spots on my pants. You know what those spots are from? Kid snot. And I cherish every spot. We have kids in our church now that are grown and have their own kids that have grabbed me around the leg and left spots on my pants in the past. You see, touching lives is a part of mobilization. You can't do it and isolate yourself in your home. Or isolate yourself with your own personal agenda. Sometimes you've got to be willing to give up some of you to God in order to get it done. Well, thousands of people, I... Uh, I got to give you a, a little bit of a praise report. Several years ago, we went to North Carolina. And uh, in fact, now for the last 10, 11, 12 years, I don't know exactly the account. I, 
I, I see people that are so good at they can say the exact day of something and the year of something. Man, I'm just glad I can look on my watch and tell what time it is. Don't ask me to go back and give you a particular day for this, that, and the other. I'm just no good at that kind of thing. That was never in my court. But 10, 11, 12 years ago, we went to North Carolina for the first time, and a, a lady uh, was my interpreter there in, at the church that we were going to. And since that time, she's been my interpreter time and time and time again, and she can't wait till I get there because she's going to interpret. And she's called me Papa forever. Uh, and till Papa gets there, and I, uh, we have conversations. I have to send her my notes. She gets everything ready. You know, I, at that particular time, it's not notes like we have today where we have notes in Spanish and English. At that time, it was just notes in English, and she'd translate them into Spanish because she was going to be my translator into Spanish. And her husband, they were poor enough that they didn't have the money for him to buy a keyboard, but he wanted to play so bad that what he did is he took a piece of cardboard and he drew keys on it like on a piano. And he would watch YouTube videos and lay his fingers on that and imagine he was playing. And he taught himself how to play. So, he became the keyboardist in the church that he was in and helped with their praise and worship. And has for several years. God had spoken to them some years ago that said the day would come that they would, they would leave where they are and come to northwest Arkansas to be with us. Why in the world would anybody want to be with us? I have no clue. But that's what they felt they, that God was going to do with them. So guess what happened? Their pastor released them And their daughter is coming in tomorrow and enrolling in gentry schools and be in school on Tuesday. And they're going to be a part of our church body starting in September. Weird. What God does. I don't understand it. But God knows every need that we have, and he doesn't bring us to the place that we're not equipped to mobilize. That's what I'm saying. Okay? So I, I would let you have this piece of information as a testimonial, but let's get back to where we are today. This week, our kids go back to school. Now, there was a time in the beginning of us doing some of the things that we do as far as praying over our kids. We prayed for protection because we didn't want them to be shot down by some arsonist idiot that goes into a school and does the stupid things that they do. And while that is a part of what we do uh, in, our, in our prayer time for our kids, the, the other thing that, that God has really di directed our hearts with is we pray for the spiritual attack that the devil is going to bring against their lives this year. Because our kids are being attacked. You see, like I said, the temptation of me 50, a long time ago in school, is nothing like the temptation our kids face today. You say, oh, it's the same old, same old. Where did you get that from? Maybe you've been smoking some weed or something. <laughs> if you think that that's the case. No, our kids are facing things you never thought about facing if you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s. 
Our kids are facing stuff in school that you cannot imagine. In fact, your kids won't even come home and tell you what they're facing because they know you wouldn't understand it in the first place. I'm serious. It's weird, the stuff that our kids are facing today. And you know what? We've got to mobilize with them so that the devil does not destroy their lives. Are you with me? To me, that's what it's about. I know that it sounds like a broken record with me. I come in on Sunday morning, and I'm amazed that people show up to listen to me because I don't know why you would come other than there's one thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for your kids. I'm going to believe God with you for them. I'm not going to judge them for their past, nor you for your past. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to help you to become victorious in your life. And that's why I'm here. I believe it's important that as a church body, we take on that kind of character. A character that says, my kids will not be destroyed by the power of the enemy. My kids are going to make it. My grandkids are going to make it. We are going to survive, and they're not just going to be compromisers. They're going to be on fire for God wherever they are, in the school system, at home, on the playground, on the, uh, at the, in the workforce, wherever they are. So, I'm going to tell you, we're changing the complexion of this place in the next three to four months. Okay? Everybody ready to fashion your seatbelt? Our van, our big, nice, beautiful van that we have here for the church, got <laughs> boards thrown through windshield and everything else. But this week, I think we get it out of the shop, and it will be back in place. Hallelujah. Now, it isn't coming back to the ranch to set and gather dust. We're going to start picking up kids. And you say, who's going to drive it? Maybe you. Ah! I don't have time, Pastor. Not me. I don't want no excuses. Amen. You say, as long as it's on the weekend when I'm not working. Because when I get off work at the end of the day, I'm tired. Oh, really? I am too. But does that really make any difference? The devil's still at work while you're tired. Is that bad? No. We're going to mobilize and we're going to build a youth group. Are you here? Are you with me? And you say, well, we're going to leave that to J-Dub and Tiffany to do that. Well, why? Don't you think God could use you too? We're going to mobilize and we're going to have ministry that's going to reach our young marrieds, our college kids, and our teenagers, and our children, we're going to mobilize like we've never mobilized before because we're in a war, and we are going to win. I stop with this. Good night, it's 11.30. Turn off your watches. 
just hear this last little piece. It's not a concert of many. It's a concert of one. God's got to call every person in this room personally. You've got to have your own personal call from God. It cannot be the call of mom and dad or the call of the husband or the wife. It's got to be your personal call from God. Isaiah 6, if I remember correctly, is the right chapter. It's in your notes, so you'll find it. It says, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now, sometimes what has to happen in our lives is things have to die for us to see God. God has to kill off some things. He has to put some things to rest in your life so that you can get to the business of the kingdom. And sometimes the reason God has to do it is because you've spent all your time on the thing that needs to die. That was really good stuff. Maybe I'll say that again. Maybe the reason it needs to die is because you're spending so much time on that that you don't have time for what God's called you to do. Busy, 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 busy. But really, is it worthwhile? Does it have kingdom merit to it? So he said, the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled with temple. And then after that, he said, he heard a voice. The voice was the voice of God. And in him hearing this voice of God, God speaking to him, his words were this, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he says, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And you know what God does? God doesn't give him any special favoritism because of what he said. It was no excuse in the eyes of God. You know what God did? God spoke to an angel and said, go over there and get these tongs and pick up a coal of fire and go put it on his lips. Whoa. Whoa. And when he does this, you know what happened? His lips were cleansed. And God said, at that time, whom shall I send? And who will go for me? It wasn't a national thing. It was a personal thing. And then Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. You say, but pastor, I'm just so busy. Then you're too busy. Then you're just too busy. You say, I've just got to get past this particular phase, this place in my life. Then I'll do something for God. And you know what? That's the devil's biggest weapon against the church is that very weapon. Is one of these days I'll get around to doing the will of God. One of these days God will use me. Right now, I've just got other things to do. But Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. Okay, stop, done. But I want to ask you a question. How many people in this room today will say, I'm ready 
for God to use me, whatever the cost. That's a big question. I'm ready for God to use me, whatever the cost, whatever it takes. I'm ready to get snot spots on my pants if necessary, whatever the cost. I don't care what it takes to see our generations one to God, see lives touched in this last day hour because time is short. If the devil's going to get violent, we got to get violent too to take it back. So I'm going to ask you a question. I need some help. I can't do it by myself. I can't drive the, the van to every activity and make sure it's done. I can't be the one that comes and loves on kids by myself at, at, at activities. I can't be everywhere and do everything. Can I tell you something? God can't either. You know what God does? He uses us. He uses our hands, our feet, our mouths, our ears, our hearts. He uses us to reach people. So my question to you today, how many people in this room will get ready to stand? Stand in the spirit, but also stand in the natural and say, Pastor, I am ready to do whatever God wants me to do to help mobilize our world and our church for this hour. If that's you. Now, don't stand to your feet if you don't mean it because I'm going to see you when you stand and I may be coming to your door, getting on the phone, calling you about it. Okay? You say, I'm ready. There they go. They're standing up. They're standing up. They're standing up. Father, today you see these who have stood. I ask you, God, now to empower them. Prepare them for whatever it is that you want them to do in your kingdom. God, let us be open to your Spirit's will for them in their lives. I ask you, God, to speak into their lives and touch them today. Use them for your glory. Let us be the here am I, send me group that's willing to do whatever task you call us to do. We are yours. We stand and we give ourselves to you now that your will, your purpose will be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now give the Lord hand praise. Hallelujah. All of our kids are coming right now. Our, our children, students here in the auditorium, please come in, and all of you. Cole, get up here, buddy. Cole's going to college. Bring our babies up here. 
Y'all just stand here and face me. Face this way. Yeah. You're so beautiful. So beautiful. Handsome guys. I'm sorry. Guys are beautiful. Guys are handsome, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you work through. I want to be more like you. Lift your hands up to him, everybody, and sing it. I want to be more like you. like to come and stand behind them I want you to do so or if you want to adopt a child because that's fantastic and fine for you to get here with them we want to see God touch every one of their lives we have again what we do every year, we have prayer claws here. Brother Andy, I think it's our anointing oils at the bottom of that treasure chest. If you can help me find that. We're going to anoint these and we're going to give them out to our kids. We want you to take this. Mama Jeannie provided you with a safety pin to pin it inside your... Uh, backpack and carry it with you to school we're believing God for God to anoint your life to be with you when you go to school wherever it's at we're believing God for his protection but more than just his protection we're believing God to mobilize you to become God's advocate God's army in the school wherever you are that you can share Jesus with a world that needs to know him will you do that amen okay everybody stretch your hands toward these here just start praying for them Lord I ask you to touch their lives. Lay your hands upon them. Touch them now. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. <laughs> Pray. Pray. God, touch him now. Lay your hand upon him.
this plan out that you had for Cole's life. Lay hand upon him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, touch him, Lord. Touch him, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, our teachers if you could come up here on the platform if we have any teachers here hallelujah hallelujah huh? now our children's church and our ministry team here at the church God I ask you to touch them all God, make this a year of mobilization. Let us mobilize for your work. Let us reach lives like we've never reached lives. Let us take this path as a serious path. We are doing war on the devil, and we will win in Jesus' name. Amen. Now give him praise. Now give him praise. We hope you enjoyed this message from Victory Church. For more information about Victory Church or to browse our media library, find us online at www.victorychurchnwa.com. Thanks be to God who always leads us in victory.